spent five days tweaking that kick drum. Five days tweaking that kick drum from nine in the morning to midnight, locked in my studio, wasting my time, nitpicking that fucking kick drum. Early on in my music career, I realized I had a problem. I would export a final version of a song, I'd call it TikTok Final. Right before uploading it to disc makers, I'd give another listen, and I'd realize that the symbols were a little bit too bright, and I'd do another mix, and I'd export the real final version this time when I was done, and I'd call it TikTok Final Final. <clears throat> and then I'd second guess myself, and I'd send the new mix to a friend who would tell me that lowering the symbols made the Juno stick way out too much, so I'd fix that, and then this process would repeat over and over and over again until my exports folder would look like this. Uh, and that's when I started thinking about the concept, uh, really, of finishing a piece of art. What was so infuriating about this is that so many of my heroes seem to be able to finish so many things. Freddie W, 231 videos. Irving Berlin, 1,500 songs. Ella Fitzgerald, 84 albums. Zach Wienersmith, 3,000 comics. Rob has a podcast, over 1,300 podcasts. J.K. Rowling, seven novels in 10 years. Peter Hollins, 27 music videos, 35 songs, an album in 2014. Hank Green, 6,868 videos. How do they finish so many things? It was mind boggling to me. And eight years later, after spending a few years in tech, I've seen engineers and designers and product managers and anyone who puts things into the world struggle with this. The key realization for me was that I think this is a vocabulary problem. When I think of things that finish, I think of meals or vacations or sports matches. The end of a sports match feels final. And a number of things contribute to this feeling. There's a binary outcome in a state change. One contender becomes a winner. The other contender becomes a loser. There's a quantitative measure of the end state, literally called the final score. And there's literally a clock that counts down to zero. Finishing a sports match feels like finality. Feels like relief. There's a simple emotion, either total elation or total disappointment. There's complete clarity. But when I finish a song, I get none of these things. There's no state change or binary outcome. The song isn't either good or bad. It's a totally qualitative spectrum. There's no countdown that hits zero. Finishing a sports match feels totally different. The finality of the sports match is replaced with a feeling of deficiency when publishing a song. The feeling of relief at the end of a sports match is replaced with a feeling of stress. Is it ready? Should I make a few more tweaks? The simple emotion at the end of a sports match, total elation or total disappointment, is replaced by complex, conflicting emotions and indecision about what to do next. The sense of clarity is replaced by a deep uncertainty. Finishing a song doesn't feel like finishing at all. We have a vocabulary problem. It's silly to use the same word to describe the conclusion of a sports match and the trailing fade out of the creative process. Publishing is not finishing. All the emotions are different. Publishing is something else. Publishing is what John Lennon did to wrap up Revolver. The following excerpt is from a book called Here, There, and Everywhere by Jeff Emmerich, the recording engineer for most of the Beatles records. We're almost there. This is it. Here we go. It wasn't until the very end, when most of Revolver was mixed and ready to be mastered, that someone realized that the album was a song short. So on the next to last night, the group began frantically rehearsing John's new song, She Said, She Said. John had always been the basher in the group. His attitude was, let's just get it done. So it was no big surprise that we got the entire song recorded and mixed in nine hours, as opposed to the more than three days we spent on Here, There, and Everywhere. It still sounds scrappy and rough to me. It's got the ragged feel of a track that was done in the middle of the night under pressure. The next day we staggered in for another five hours of mixing and sequencing, and the album was done. Incredibly, Revolver had been completed in just over 10 weeks, with many songs only taking a few hours to get down on tape. That's publishing. Publishing is deciding to stop when you want to keep working, and it's super painful. Some people can't do it, and some people can. Freddie W. and Ella Fitzgerald and Zach Wienersmith and Rob has a podcast and Hank Green and Peter Hollins and J.K. Rowling. So how do they finish so many things? They don't, but they publish them anyway. Publishing, though, is more than just a single decisive moment. It's more than just the art of identifying the point at which additional work yields diminishing marginal returns. For me now, publishing starts the instant I start recording a new song. 
Publishing, I found, works best if you think of it as a style of working. It's an attitude that persists throughout the entire creative process, from the moment you begin work to the moment you give it up to the world. Working to publish is about getting shit done the whole time. Your whole mentality shifts when you're working to publish. You focus on the stuff that matters and you ignore the stuff that doesn't. Even the fun stuff, the stuff that calls out to you and begs you to enjoy 30 minutes satisfying your obsessive desire to make something perfect that only you will notice. You write the next scene, you record the next instrument, you build the next set, you shoot the next take, you design the next synth. Working to publish, it's selfless. It's outward focused. It's about results and giving back and contributing to the world. Working for pleasure is how I used to spend most of my time working. It's inward focused. It's slow and enjoyable, but ultimately it's about giving to oneself. It's rooted in the ego. It's fixing details that you and only you care about. It's a luxurious self-indulgence. It's calm and it's a great way to unwind and relax. And it's freaking fun as heck. But like any luxury, I try my best to use it sparingly. I feel like a bit of a hypocrite here because working to publish is hard. And for me, it's more of a North Star than it is like a habit. Um, it's a framework that I aspire to, not something that I'm great at or figured out. When I look back at my YouTube catalog, I'm reminded of a period between October 2011 and March 2013 when I only published one video. And that video is not even mine. <laughs> so it really shouldn't even count. Basically, I went for 17 months without publishing anything. I'd been learning how to make electronic music, and instead of putting out my stuff, I was fretting over the details. <laughs> I have a memory from that period of working on a song and comparing it to a Skrillex track and feeling like my kick drum was too wimpy. I spent five days tweaking that kick drum. Five days tweaking that kick drum from nine in the morning to midnight, locked in my studio, wasting my time, nitpicking that fucking kick drum. I got chased by the monster of your kick drum isn't good enough as a professional kick drum. I forgot about working to publish and I did that for 17 months. I released nothing. My heroes are great publishers. My heroes have mastered the art of doing only what matters the whole time and then stopping. I think that's badass. It's a great strategy because the world is made of funnels. Everything is a funnel. This is something I learned working at Patreon. In order for a sales team to be successful, they have to send 10,000 emails to get 1,000 responses, to find 500 mm. people interested, to get 100 phone calls, to get 20 okay. commitments, to get 10 sales. This phenomenon is called a funnel, and it appears everywhere. For websites, a million people visit the homepage, 100,000 click learn more, 10,000 click buy, 6,000 make it to the second page of the payment flow, 2,000 enter their credit cards, and 1,800 of those credit cards process payments without declining. The world is made of funnels. I remember realizing how this phenomenon could apply to my everyday life about a year ago. It was Monday and I wanted to see a doctor by the end of the week. I'm not gonna tell you why, it's gross. Um, <laughs> I ended up using Yelp to find a really promising sounding doc with good reviews. I called them, the phone rang four times, the machine picked up, at which point I left a message. Hi, uh, my name's Jack Conti. Two days went by, I hadn't gotten a response yet. So I called back and left another message. I called a couple days ago. A day later, I got a phone call from a nurse. Yes, that's me. And after explaining my symptoms, they informed me that they didn't treat people with my particular problem and that it'd be better to call a different specialist. Oh, you don't. A week into the process, I was back at square one. A full week had gone by, I wasn't any closer to seeing a doctor. Then I remembered that the world is made of funnels. So I went back to Yelp and this time I found eight doctors that looked promising and determined five of them would work for me and called them all. My name's Jack Conti. Three of them answered their phones. Two of them had appointments available in the next two weeks. You do. One of them could see me right away, which meant that I had just funneled the shit out of doctor's appointments. Because the world is made of funnels. That's why working to publish is a great strategy because you end up making a lot more stuff for the top of the funnel. At one point I heard some lore that Irving Berlin was said to have written 10 songs for every one that he released. And that means that he wrote 15,000 songs in his life. And he published 1,500 of them. Of those, 25 songs hit number one on the charts. He was nominated for 12 Tonys and Academy Awards and won four of them. Irving Berlin, whether he knew it or not, was a funnel master. But let's look at his batting average for a second. That's 15,000 songs and four awards. That's 0.026% conversion through the funnel. And he had no idea which songs would hit and which ones wouldn't because you can't choose what you're famous for. I learned that lesson the hard way after spending a measly one day making a YouTube video that now has 
has 9 million views and spending six months working on a record that sold less than 300 copies. You can't choose what you're famous for. That's up to the funnel. I can't make a song a hit. That's up to the funnel. I can't control how my songs push through the world and are experienced by others. That's up to the funnel. But what I can do is be prolific. I can be creative. I can make great stuff. What I can do is work to publish. You write the next scene, you record the next instrument, you build the next set, you shoot the next take, you design the next synth. And then I can give those things up to the funnel and I can move on and I can go to sleep at night knowing that I did everything I could. <laughs>